All right, buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, so today I want to talk about how many saved people will be living in the end of the world. All right, so first of all, before we get into that, let's take a look at an example of how many people will be saved, period. And of course, Revelation 7 gives us a description of all the saved people at the end of the world. Alright, and so it, um, let me just read it a little bit here. It says, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the seas, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now this is when we are transformed into our glorified bodies when we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye when we put on incorruption and when we put on immortality this is that same moment till we have sealed the servants of our god in their forehead so we are changed forever at that moment and that moment is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. All right, and I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the church of the children of Israel. All right, so we're getting 12 tribes of 12,000 that are sealed, and then after this. I beheld and lo a great num a multitude which no man could number of all nations kindreds and people and tongues stand before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our God which sits upon the throne and unto the lamb all right so here we got a bunch of people a number that no man could number okay a great multitude which no man could number alright so what I gather from this is that 144,000 is just a represent uh, representative number it's not okay it's not at all the limited amount of people that will be saved at the end of the world it's, it doesn't mean that at all and these 144,000 they do not get special rewards over those that are of this group okay we all get the same reward and that is eternal life you couldn't ask for a greater reward than that so when we go to read about the 144,000 later in the book of Revelation we just know we can know that this just symbolizes all the people that are saved and not at all in a limited amount of people that will be saved okay I, I get it people make it really complicated but it really is very simple that's it's and it's important to understand too. It's important to know that it's simple and know that it's easy to understand the word of God. But I get it. Men come in and they complicate it. They really do. And it ought not be that way. All right. So now let's take a look at how many people will be living when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. So the first place I want to go to is First Thessalonians 4. Let me open this up. And, and starting in verse 16, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. All right, so here, this is, again, the very same moment in time when the angels of God seal the servants of God in their foreheads, just like what we read in Revelation 7. All right, and it talks about them that are sealed. All right. And that's in their foreheads when we are changed. Now, right now, we that are born of God, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. Ephesians 4, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, here in Revelation 7, here comes the angels to seal uh, the servants of God in their foreheads. This is just a simple description of when we are changed. Okay? It's like what we read in 1 Thessalonians 4. It talks about first the dead in Christ, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Therefore, we're all resurrected at the same time. Alright, so we go to 1 Corinthians 15. And we see that every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. All right, so Jesus Christ is the first fruit of the resurrected. He has ascended to heaven, and then when he returns, we are lifted up into the air to be with the Lord forever. So this is all throughout the Bible, okay? Now... Uh, it's important, I think, to understand that this is not the first of several resurrections. All right, not, and First Corinthians 15 makes it very clear: at the end of the world, we that are Christ are resurrected together as one. First Thessalonians 4. It says, first the dead in Christ, then we which are alive. We are all resurrected together. All right, there is not a, another resurrection after that. Okay, that's important, and it's not complicated. It's very simple, consistent all throughout the Bible. A lot of false teachers will tell you that there are multiple resurrections there's not it's never mentioned anywhere in the bible at all all right and going and all i mean this is all throughout the bible this is not like one verse we have to try to dis discern this is consistent all throughout the bible in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So, this is going to happen at the end of the world. <laughs> it's unbelievable, man. This is not multiple dispensations. It's a one-time deal. At the end of the world, the great day of the Lord, Judgment Day. And when he comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of this world. And of course, we can go to Genesis 3, just to... Um, make it even more clear. 
The Lord says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. When God stomps his foot on the head of the serpent, he will put an end to evil forever. All right, this is consistent all throughout the Bible. All right, and we can go, here, let's go here. Psalm 10, and the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. 1 Corinthians 15, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. So, all of our enemies are going to be gathered at our feet. That means we're up in the air. Alright? And this is a one-time moment at the end of the world, Judgment Day, the great day of the Lord, when we are lifted up in the air, our enemies gather at our feet, and they are destroyed forever. That's Judgment Day. That's the great day of the Lord. Now, how many people will be saved? Well, we, you know, just as I talked about earlier, a whole bunch. Of, no man can number, right? No man can number. Just a whole bunch of people. But, let's go back to First Thessalonians 4. And notice here, We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. We which are alive and remain. So this is as if Jesus comes back today. And we that are alive and saved... Will be caught up together with them that have died and are resurrected and saved okay so how many of this group if you will now to keep in mind we all get the same reward and this reward that we're getting is we couldn't ask for a greater reward than eternal life no man is going to have an advantage over another man in the life to come. Okay? That's important because people imply that, hey, I got more rewards. I got rewards for this and rewards for that that I'm going to get in the life to come hereafter. No, you're not. You'd be lucky to get one reward with that attitude. Really? Really? Because the reward that our Lord is going to give us cannot be matched. Can, it, nothing could be greater than what he's going to give us. And that is eternal life. A life without evil whatsoever. Where there's no sin, no death, no sorrow, no crying no pain all right so i want to talk about how many people will be alive at this moment when jesus comes so there are a whole bunch of dead people are going to resurrect but how many people that are actually living are going to be saved And uh, there's, you know, probably, let's see, how do I want to approach this, you know? Let's start off in Matthew 24. All right. And pay attention here. It says, except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now that's interesting because what this is saying is that if God let things play out the way they're playing out, then there would come a point 
where there would be nobody alive on the earth that was saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So, that can only mean we are approaching um, the end of the world with fewer and fewer people that are saved. And this is very, very interesting. So let's go to Matthew 7. And notice here in verse 21, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works and then i will profess unto them i never knew you depart from me ye that work iniquity now notice here it says many will say to me in that day many not some but many so this tells us that when jesus comes in the clouds of heaven that Christians will not be locked up as many false pe uh, teachers preach today. This idea that, well, there's going to come an Antichrist and he's going to lock up all the Christians. That's not going to happen. That's not in the Bible anywhere at all. Many people claiming to be Christians will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and done many wonderful works this tells us there's going to be a whole lot of people claiming to be christians notice here when jesus is asked about the end of the world he says take the very first thing he says is take heed that no man deceive you for many not some but many will come in my name saying, I am Christ, I, Jesus, am Christ, and shall deceive many. Again, there's a lot of people that are claiming to be Christians who are not God's people. And this idea, again, that... And some antichrist is going to come in and lock up all the Christians. That's not that's not in the Bible, at all. That's never going to happen. There's not coming some great political leader that's going to lock up all the Christians. Again, you can't get around this. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. Okay. Now, let's go to Luke 18, if I'm remembering correctly. And let's start off right here. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? So we're going to see a lot of people claiming to be Christians but they are not going to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as an example here in Matthew 7 they are trusting in their own works their own self to be saved they are gonna think well I deserve to be saved because I've done many wonderful works and these people are not 
trusting in Jesus at all. If you don't have one, if you don't put all of your trust in what he has done, you don't trust him at all. If you have any trust in yourself, you have no trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You either fully depend on him or you don't depend on him at all. All right. And so this is this is we can see this in the world. This is what's happening. People are thinking, "Hey, I'm a good person. I go to church on Sunday. I'm going to be saved. I got baptized when I was a little baby. Some preacher sprinkled water on me, and so I'm saved." Well, that preacher doesn't save you. I guarantee you that church doesn't save you. I guarantee you. There's only one that can save you. And you can't even you can't save your buddies, you can't save yourself, you can't save nothing. I I can't save nothing. I can't save you. I can't save myself. I can't save money. I can't save nothing. Okay. <laughs> It's really that clear. It really is. That simple. Now, when Jesus comes, shall he find faith on the earth? That's a heck of a question, isn't it? That's a heck of a question. Shall he find faith on the earth so we go back to revelation 7 we notice hey there's a whole bunch of people saved a number or a multitude that no man can number a lot of people are saved well almost all of them are going to be people who have who have passed away all right so there's going to be some of us which are alive and remain and we're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds. And then the wrath of God is going to be poured upon the earth and all the unjust. The only way for us to be just is because Jesus is just. And he chooses us. It doesn't matter if we choose him. He chooses us. And when he chooses us, we are justified. And when he comes in the clouds of heaven, we are lifted up. And the wrath of God is poured upon the unsaved. Now, when Jesus comes, shall he find faith on the earth? What's interesting here is, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Now, as it was in the days of Noah before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving a marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Right? I mean, they were just going about their lives. Just like we are today, going about our lives. So there's not coming a time when an antichrist political figure will come on a scene and start locking up Christians. That, If that were to happen, people would be on high alert, wouldn't they? There's not coming this great event that's going to tip off the end of the world. The end of the world is going to come on a day just like today. All right, for as it was in the day, or for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of Son of Man be. All right, it's going to come in an hour when you least expect it. Let's see if I can find something to support that. Come on, I don't know. It says something. Somewhere in the Bible it says something. Coming in at an hour. Oh, my goodness. I thought, I thought, I thought wrong. Coming. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. No, 
I guess I don't know. What verse am I looking for? What is the verse I'm looking for? Oh boy. Uh oh. Uh, okay, I guess I'm gonna have to take a pass on this. I don't remember what the phrasing was. Why? But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels. Oh, I get it, I get it. I think I know. Watch, therefore you know not know, for you know not the, what hour the Lord does come. So that's, that's probably a simple, that's what I'm talking about. But the wording is, uh, therefore be also ready for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. All right, so, and again, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looks not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of. Watch therefore for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. All right, and then we read uh, parallels here in um, Mark 13 and Luke 21. But of that day and hour knows no man, no, not the angels in heaven which are, uh, the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father only. Right? And then we'll, let's skip ahead to Luke 21, if you will. No, I guess it's not Luke 21. No. Just Matthew and Mark. Alright, so it's interesting. Anyways, so the, the point is Jesus is going to come at an hour at a time when nobody's expecting it. So it's going to be a day just like today. It's not going to be some great antichrist is going to come and take over the world and lock up all the Christians. That's never going to happen. That sort of a teaching only takes away from the reality that the Pope in Rome is the Antichrist. And he's been here a very long time. <laughs> it's so obvious it's dumb. It really is. It's, but he, again, what's Jesus say? For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Uh, and for my Catholic friend or friends, uh, think about this. Seriously. Now, you could also look at Mormons. Are Mormons Christians? No. Nope. They are not. They say they are, but they're not. Are Catholics Christians? Of course not. They're a different religion altogether. Many shall come in my name, saying, I, Jesus, am Christ, and shall deceive many. And except the Lord sh uh, shorten those days, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So, we're going to have very, very few people who are alive and remain when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. Luke 18, Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? And then we take a look at when Noah was saved, or, uh, well, when Noah was saved, when uh, the floods came when that world came to an end and God destroyed the world by water. All right. In 1 Peter chapter 3, when in some time we're disobedient, when once the long suffering God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight 
souls were saved by water. Eight. Now I did uh, some calculating on this uh, a while back because I was just curious, right? And I uh, wanted to know, you know, hey, how many people could have been living in the 1656 years since the beginning of the creation when Adam and Eve were made in the garden when they were in the garden from that point on, the, on day six to year 1656 how many people could have been alive and of course uh, I only had to go a hundred years to get to 2.5 million people so it doesn't, you know, from that point on, you can see in 150 years, there could have been over 2 billion people. In 200 years, there could have been 2 trillion people, a lot more people than what are alive today, just in 200 years. The population can boom very quickly. And that's what I was curious about because once you get to a, you know, once you get these numbers up, boom, they multiply upon multiply. All right. Now, and, but yet, yeah, nevertheless, in the days of Noah, there were only eight souls saved Noah, his three sons, and their four wives. That was it. So also, when Jesus comes, will there be eight souls saved that are living on the earth? You know, think about that. I mean, what if that was not in doubt, this verse would not exist. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? And then you go to Matthew 24 and you see, except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. Implying that if God let things play out, there would come a point to where there was nobody alive on the earth that was saved. So let me ask you this. Do you believe that we are in uh, very close to the end time when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven? So if you are, then you have to fully reject the idea that the Roman Catholic Church is the true church of God. You have to. You have to dismiss it. You have to say, look, this is obvious. Because 1.378 billion Catholics in the world today, or if the Catholics were the true church of God, we would not be anywhere near the end of the world. It doesn't make any sense, man. I mean, we're not even. We're about that many years away from the end of the world. And this question here, this forget about it. Because you're not going to see it for generations upon generations. You're not going to see the end of the world for a very, very, not in your lifetime, I guarantee it won't even be close. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? You see here that in the days of Noah, there was only eight people saved. And that's incredible. Now, in the days of when Sodom and Gomorrah got destroyed by fire you know we see Abraham uh, you know uh, bargaining with God said look man you know are you gonna destroy this place what you know what if there are 50 righteous right what if there are yeah I mean you're gonna Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? 
saying, hey, look, there, there might be 50 good people in those cities. Aren't you, you know, God, aren't you going to spare them? What about them? The good people. Yeah, there's a bunch of filthy people. But what about the good people? And God says, okay, I, if I find 50 righteous within the city, then I'll spare that whole place because of those 50. And then Abraham got to thinking, well, you know what? I, I'm pretty familiar with the, I'm pretty familiar with Sodom. And, uh, boy, 50 might be a stretch. Um, so he, he says, well, you know, how, what if there's 45? Because 50, man, that's, I'm not so sure about 50. Okay, well, what, what if there's 45? You know, I don't want, you know, I don't want you destroying that, you know, place because there's, not quite 50 and he goes to 45 and, he, and he, the more and more he thinks about it the more and more he realizes man they're just there aren't very many righteous people in that city and heck you know what oh man i'm not sure there's even 10 righteous but he's able to get that number down to 10. Verse 32, and he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet, but this once, peradventure, ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. If there are ten righteous in that city, I will not destroy it. And that's, boy, you know what? The more and more Abraham thought about it, the less confident he became, didn't he? And then what ended up happening? Well, there wasn't even ten righteous in that city. Just like in the days of Noah, only eight souls were saved. Now, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, there's this question that's on the table. Shall he find faith on the earth? 